Welcome to Philosophical Shorts. This regards a question I received earlier from a correspondent in the Guardian. My article on just war theory, which is on the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy, and the difference between just cause and right intention. As she says, they seem to be very similar, trivial indifference at most. Could you please explain the differences? Well, it's a great question, and the question goes to the heart of a deeply contested philosophical problem, indeed one which psychologists have also sought to shed light on, but perhaps something also that the great poets and authors have also sought to map out. Because if we start with a quotation from Shakespeare's Macbeth, we might get to the heart of part of the matter. There's no art to find the mind's construction in the face, says King Duncan, Act 1, Scene 4. It's a phrase that makes us think, do we really know people? Can we really tell what they are about? That is their innate nature. King Duncan was quietly raging over the dissimulation of his Thane of Codor, who betrayed his feudal oath of allegiance to Duncan. Yet Percy Bysse Shelley, in his A Defence of Poetry, contrasts the inner self with the inevitable outwardness of action. To quote, The beauty of the internal nature cannot be so far concealed by its accidental vesture that the spirit of its form shall communicate itself to the very disguise and indicate the shape it hides from the manner in which it is worn. A majestic form and graceful motions will express themselves through the most barbarous and tasteless costume. Now Shelley refers to the gracefulness of the good of good people and the inevitability that Aristotle long ago commented upon that they would eventually rise to the surface of public life, that is, the good will happen to good people and the bad consequences, shall we say, to bad people. My correspondent was wondering if there is any difference between possessing just cause in action and right intention a problem that King Duncan mused upon, and one which Shelley thought could not disguise the innately good person. In philosophy we may examine the nature of mind and of action, and how the two relate, and how the two may indeed conflict when it comes to intentionality, or what we intend to do, and action, what we actually do. So let's divide just cause and right intention. On the basic level, the just cause, clause as it were, implies that a person has a moral or ethical reason for doing something, say rescuing another person from imminent danger, or telling the truth to unravel a host of lies that are harming others. In Let's say there has been an aggressive invasion of our country. Keeping things simple, this is a violation of morality and or international laws, and so our country has a justifiable cause, we say, or a sense of justice, to defend and uphold our political integrity and sovereignty, and hence may use war as a means to defend itself. The right intention clause refers to the mindset behind such actions, the initiation of war in this case, which is also good in its own right. That means that the flow of action warfare from that intention is done for good, proper, moral, legal reasons rather than for, say, ulterior motives such as an excuse to annex a territory, violate an alliance or to assert a new political order in the area in its favour as it beats back the invaders. It's possible, of course. War and human criminal law have thrown up all sorts of reasons attached to actions. I imagine that many authors and wise people or legal experts can be referred to who note that intentionality is somewhat what we call private in philosophy. That means it's hidden to others, as King Duncan noted. No art to find the mind's construction in the face. Yet if the intention is made public through doing a good deed, say, David Hume, a Scottish philosopher from the 1760s era, asked whether it really matters if a person gives charity to appease their guilt or look good in front of others when a poor person's suffering is lessened. Thus a king may wage a justifiable war of self-defence for vanity, to prove himself to his relatives or court, or to empower the treasury or state governance over the people, and yet his actions may save the nation from invasion. Perhaps, as Hume is hinting, the result is more important again hinting at an older wisdom, that we know a person by their actions. So, we could argue that we get to know a person's intentions from the actions that they take. Even if the cause is justifiable from an objective or rule of law point of view, such as a neighbour invading our territory, the intent may eventually manifest itself into a reality after a period. For example, that the justification of self-defence was actually part of a ruse or a grander scheme to weaken the neighbour 
in order to conquer or subjugate its people somehow or other. In other words, the intention was dark or negative relative to the ethical goodness of defending a people. Perhaps, then, the results speak louder than proclamations. A perspective that I have recently been drawn to is that a division between our actions and intentions may imply a clash between a non-integrous or an integrous state of being that just war theorists and other wise folk, of course, through the ages have been aware of and made explicit. What do I mean by integrity or integrous? It means bringing your principles together. So consider. Most people live life with a host of conflicting beliefs, some of which do indeed lead to action, or sometimes inaction because they are so contradicted. And yet when we bring them together and say we want them to be principled and good, integrous that is to spirit, God, universe, however we term it, rather than being against the deeper sense of goodness that permeates our life in varying degrees. So action and intentionality can be brought into a harmony. Rather than pursuing good action with a deviant intention, or vice versa, pursuing a deviant action with a good intention, as the path to hell is paved with good intentions, on a more metaphysical plane, I see the problem as hinting more broadly to all of us to get our houses, our minds, in order, and to relay that to our actions, to bring together justifiable action and right intention. Now we can quibble, and philosophers certainly do, about the terms, the words used, but just think about times when you see others, or yourself, believe in the righteousness of one action and then take an opposing action. Then we seek out the goodness of our intentions by referring to higher political, ethical or spiritual values, and good action tends to make much more sense and should fall into play, as it were. And, by the way, we feel much better, more whole, more connected to everything good around us, whatever terms we use. Values such as reasoning over violence, listening over imposing, forgiveness over revenge, love over hatred, courage over fear, and a host of political notions to throw in, such as upholding representative and accountable government, freedoms of religion, expression, association, etc. etc. If we believe in a good value such as honesty, and yet we lie, we do ourselves and the reality in which we live a gross disservice. And arguably our body, our heart, our soul, whatever you wish to call it, knows it knows it so well that we wake in the night fretting, our body gets sick and our actions become erratic and strange to ourselves and to others. It reminds us of Dostoevsky's Raskolnikov in Crime and Punishment, or if we return to Macbeth, to the visions that plague Macbeth and his queen after their murder of Duncan, visions and unearthly knocking that reminds them of the power of conscience. When we act conscientiously, we act in accordance with principle, we become integrous. And so our intention flows into our actions and our actions reflect our intentions. Thank you for listening. This is Dr. Alex Mosley for Philosophical Shorts.